Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the virtual home of the Princeton Public Library here on Crowdcast. I'm Madeline Rosenberg, the Public Humanities Specialist here at the library, and it's my pleasure to host tonight's program. This program is presented in partnership with Princeton University Press and with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Tonight, we will hear from Karen J. Greenberg in conversation with Julian E. Zelizer about her new book, Subtle Tools, The Dismantling of American Democracy from the War on Terror to Donald Trump. As professors Greenberg and Zelizer discuss the book's many themes, I should note that the date of this program is no accident, with today marking the first anniversary of the January 6th Capitol insurrection, a significant backdrop to this evening's discussion. Karen J. Greenberg is director of the Center on National Security at Fordham Law, an international studies fellow at New America, and a permanent member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Her books include Rogue Justice, The Making of the Security State, and The Least Worst Place, Guantanamo's First Hundred Days. Julian E. Zelzer is the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University and a CNN political analyst and a regular guest on NPR's Here and Now. He's the author of and editor of 22 books, including Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of the Speaker, and The Rise of the New Republican Party from Penguin Press. The New York Times named this book as an editor's choice and one of the 100 notable books in 2020. His new book, Abraham Joshua Heschel, A Life of Radical Amazement, just came out from Yale University Press. So I'd like to share just a few housekeeping items before we begin. If you'd like to buy a copy of Subtle Tools, it's available from Labyrinth Books. You can click the link in the chat or you can click the green button at the bottom of my screen. In addition, um, with regard to Crowdcast, we recommend using Chrome for this experience if you're able to. Firefox is the second best browser for that. We also would ask that you close as many tabs as possible, especially any playing audio or video, and avoid having multiple Crowdcast tabs open at the same time. This event is being recorded. Recordings are typically uploaded onto the library's YouTube channel at a later date. And if you have thoughts or comments throughout the program, we ask that you put them in the chat on the right hand side of your screen. Um, if you have a question that you're hoping the speakers can address at the end of the program, please put them in the ask a question box at the bottom of your screen. And without further ado, it's now my pleasure to turn things over to Professor Zelizer. Thank you so much. Here and, and to discuss this book. Um, and I'm excited to spend some time with Karen. Uh, uh, about really uh, an important new piece of work that I think brings a lot of issues we tend to discuss as um, being solely about the last few years and instead to take a multi-decade look at how we got here and to use the framework of, of national security um, and more to understand where we are. So welcome. Uh, and I guess I'll start, I mean, this is the question everyone's asking today, um, but I'll, I'll start before we get to your book of uh, maybe a few of your thoughts or reflections a year after uh, January 6th and and how you're thinking about that event or that period one year later. So thank you uh, for doing this. Thank you to Madeline and to the Princeton Library and to Princeton Press, actually, for publishing the book. So, um, yeah, so I've been giving a lot of thought to this, obviously, because it's been in our face all day. But But I had anyway, you know, the book ends with January 6th. Um, and um, I think some things became very clear today that I think continue the narrative of the book and some that raise questions about where we're headed. The first thing is that um, the January 6th um, insurrection had a number of names. From the minute it happened, the press, um, the con congresspersons, um, everybody was trying to figure out what to call it. Was it a siege? Was it a riot? Was it a coup? I think today, what is really clear is that we finally agree, sort of we as a public, that it was an insurrection. And I think one of the thing about, about President Biden's speech today was his continual use of that word without shying away from it. And one of the points my books made is my books make is that language matters and that and backing away from language, being imprecise, allowing people to be confused about what something is or isn't is not helpful. And so Having a narrative, this is the beginning of having a narrative that we can give words to. 
And we can, you could still call them rioters, you can call them insurrectionists, you can distinguish between the coup part of this and the insurrection part of it. But the fact is that we, we now have a, a word for it, that the president has talked about it, um, and, that, and that I noticed the media kept using without backing away from it in any way um, all uh, after the speech. And so I think you know, that's one takeaway from what happened today. I think the second thing is that you know we've been through a lot of um, iterations of what the president can and can't do, what Congress can and can't do, what the courts can and can't do since where I began my this book uh, since 9/11, and and you could probably back this up, you know, from from your work, but. The fact is that the things I try to talk about in this book were pr quite pronounced during the um, insurrection itself and what led to the insurrection. And some of them had to do with intentional confusing and confusion and crippling of bureaucracy, which we saw when the uh, Capitol Police were unable to call in uh, help. Um, and we can talk about that later because I think that's a very important moment. One of them has to do with taking secrecy to new levels, um, which happened during the insurrection, and we can talk about that. Um, some of it had to do with this complete abrogation of norms that allowed January 6th to happen, by which I mean having an acting Secretary of Defense, having a, a Secretary of Homeland Security whose tenure was illegal, actually, for how long he'd been uh, in the position, um, and many other things that led to what happened that day. It wasn't a mistake. Um, it was something that the, the subtle tools, as I call them, was very useful for. And what I saw today was this attempt of Congress and the Department of Justice to sort of find a way out and still being hindered by the same inability to articulate what it is they're doing, the same uh, inability to uh, contest the use of secrecy, by which I mean defying subpoenas, holding back records, and, and more, um, that continues to be possible within our attempt to hold on to our democracy. So those are just some general, general thoughts about how this fits into the kind of archetypes that I'm talking about, about tools that I think you can fix all the policies all, all you want until you take away these tools and make them um, unusable. We're in trouble. And how do you, so the, your book joins a, a kind of group of works that have looked at the erosion of democracy, the dismantling of democracy, different, different takes on what's been going on with our democratic institutions. And yours really, I think, is important in centering on the national security state uh, as, a, as a framework for understanding what's going on. How does the 9-11 to today period compare to the 1947 to you know, end of the Cold War, 1991, uh, because back then there were also discussions of some of this with the CIA and secrecy. How do you think of that comparison? What's, what's more distinct or what is distinct about this current period? Um, good question. I, I mean, thank you. And probably something you could talk about as well as I could talk about. So curious as to your thoughts, but um, look, yes, there's, um, there's secrecy, covert uh, action, um, um, presidents who abuse their power, um, you know, prior to 1947 also, but let's just say since 1947, um, the um, intentional and secret abrogation of norms and laws. This is not new to American history, and, and you and I can both talk about that. What was new was the scope, the brazenness with which these norms were pushed aside, and um, a level of secrecy that we hadn't seen before. You know, one of the things that we talk about the, you know, uh, the way in which more and more classified documents, you know, more classified during George Bush, they always say, than the rest of American history combined. Whether or not that's actually the case, it's, it's essentially the case. And so it's the scope. It was the scope, some of which was made possible by the kind of technology that we now have whether it's uh, military technology or cyber technology or whatever it is. So I would say it's not that different in, in the premises and the idea of it, but it's astronomically different in terms of the breadth, the scope, and the willingness to use it. Um, and to do so confident, confident, and this is maybe a distinction from the past, that there would be no accountability. And um, the subtle tools, uh, let's just, since everyone has not read the book, but you should buy a copy, maybe you can just walk us through in this current period what some of those subtle tools are, even though you've mentioned a few of them. Yeah, so the subtle tools, the first one is the intentional imprecision of language. And actually, I want to say the subtle tool is imprecision. 
that starts with language and then leads into laws and institutions and policies. And, you know, I don't know where you want me to start, but the, I, there are three what I call sort of founding documents in this, the use of the subtle tools in the 21st century and the post 9-11 era. The first one is something that's been in the news a lot lately, the authorization for the use of military force from 2001, which basically said, did not name an enemy. This was for the invasion of Afghanistan after the attacks. Did not name an enemy, did not have a temporal framework, did not have a geographical framework, and basically, could have been and was a carte blanche for the president to use power wherever he wanted around the world. It's been used in at least 19 countries that we know of, continues to this day despite our pull out of Afghanistan, um, and was the, the imprecision of it is what allowed the expansiveness of it. And that continue. So that would be, you know, one, so one of the tools is imprecision mm -hmm. in language and you can play it out in different presidents. Um, in the Obama administration, the most um, um, egregious and well-known use of it was the redefinition of the word imminence for the use of targeted uh, kill, drone killings, that imminence, instead of meaning it what could be used in self-defense against um, an enemy that was about to attack us, could be used for an enemy who we knew had bad intentions, there was no doubt about that, and could someday attack us. That's a very different definition of imminence and, and you know, the most infamous one, I think, from that period of time. Um, so that's one subtle tool. A second subtle tool is um, what I call um, bureaucratic porousness, was the use of agencies to switch powers and switch authorities. And we've seen it in some ways that are delineated and that make some kind of sense when, again, with drone killings, when you think about um, the CIA and the, Pent and the Pentagon coordinating on different stages of deciding to use a targeted strike. But that aside, um, it was something that the Department of Homeland Security in its creation gave a new level of codification and institutionalization to by putting together so many different agencies with so many different kinds of authorities and so many different kinds of missions. And as a result, it was confused from the beginning as many people worried that it would be, many Congress persons worried that it would be. We saw the first disastrous results of that lack of structure, lack of hierarchy, lack of shared mission um, uh, with Hurricane Katrina. And we've seen it repeatedly in a number of, of uh, ways. And we can talk about that more in your life. The third uh, subtle tool is taking secrecy to new levels. This willingness to say, look, you know, it's one thing to have a Department of Justice that writes um, classified memos. It's another thing to have a Department of Justice that writes memos that intentionally abrogate the law, um, and it is done in secret, right? And to do this in a wide, the amount of secrecy that was um, uh, was okayed in the name of national security, starting with 9-11, as I said before, was exponential. By the time we get to, uh, so let me just say, President Obama famously came in on, you know, the first days of his presidency, said, we're going to have, we're going to end this excessive secrecy. We're going to uh, honor transparency. It didn't happen. It didn't happen in the ways that, that, that we thought it would after that. And I would say that with Trump, Trump it took it to new levels was that Trump realized that if you don't write things down and you don't take records, then you don't have to hide things. Because, and I think you're seeing some of that now and how they're playing out this investigation, right? These testimonies are important. They may be more important than we know because who knows what records were kept and where. And um, so anyway, so secrecy is another one. And then the, the fourth one, which is both stands on its own and is a culmination of the combination of these, of these other ones is the willing and aggressive abandonment of laws and norms. And the ways in which if it's national security, then you know what, we can push things aside. Um, and whether it's laws against torture um, or much more, much smaller laws about process and procedural um, ways that decisions are taken um, at, in the uh, National Security Council or at the White House, um, uh, that there was a way in which norms could be pushed aside willfully um, in the name of national security. And we live with that till this day. And, and uh, one of the questions that always emerges when you're discussing these kinds of issues is agency. And I mean, you went through the presidents, but imprecision in language, kind of where does that come from? Is it President Bush thinks of this? Is Are you talking about the military industrial complex kind of model? How do you see right. the drive for these changes? 
So that's into, I, I love that question because no, I do not think a deep state got together and said, okay, we're going to be, I think it was a cultural change in terms of governance that nobody said it, which is why it's such a, a powerful tool. In a way, it just sort of us most in the sense that it worked here. And look, when you're crafting laws in Congress, and this is something you know well, when you're crafting laws in Congress and you're making compromises about what you can put in the law that a, a legislator will sign on to and won't, imprecision can sometimes help. Okay, we won't name it. We won't put a limit on it. It'll be okay. Don't worry. The bottom line of this is that we have a government that, like it or not, depends to some extent, to a large extent, on trust me officials and trust me a governance. And what, what these tools enabled them to do in precision and was to abrogate that trust and to say, yeah, you can trust me, but I'm just going to make this a little broader, a little more imprecise because we might need it someday. And so it wasn't a you know cabal of people getting together. It was, it worked. Look at the AUMF. There were mm-hmm. individuals, notably Barbara Lee and others who said, no, no, this is, are, are you kidding? This is unbearably broad. We've never seen anything like this. Um, and so um, it was a tolerance for it rather than a, a determination to do it. And once it was tolerated, anybody's game. And it's, I mean, it's interesting. There's a tension. A lot of uh, histories of the 70s through today are about the growing distrust in government institutions and growing distrust in officials. But there's this narrative you're talking about where that trust me mentality actually works uh, pretty well. And so they almost coexist from what you're saying. Yeah, and I think, look, Obama was the president that basically came in and said, look, I'm, I'm, I know what the law is. I respect the law. I'm going to take care of the law. I'm going to do it. And it didn't, it didn't work to put the brakes on things. It just left these subtle tools on the table. Um, and, you know, when you hear Attorney General Garland saying, you know, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to fix it. You know, a lot. Bob Mueller, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to fix it. There's a way in which good intentions are not enough. So. And, and and so one of the issues um, is that the people are interested in our partisan differences if they exist on these questions. And you've mentioned Obama. And in the book, you have uh, really great sections on Obama and secrecy and some of the ways he wasn't as transparent and then on targeted assassinations um, and the famous memo. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you've, you've started, but kind of expand on how he fits uh, and how what he says about this issue of are there partisan differences on these questions? You know, it's a. I think Obama did not appreciate. This is I would like to hear you on this. I don't think Obama appreciated the the political reality that he was entering, and so whatever he thought about the partisan the partisan dimension of this, the degree to which it could just sideline any of his intentions and by sidelining them and his ability to do what he wanted to do. Guantanamo is the best example. The coming out there on day one, I'm going to close Guantanamo in a year without any sense of how difficult it was going to be in terms of the political conversation. So I think there was a naivete there. By the way, it's a naivete that is sort of commendable on one level, which is look who we can be, look what we can accomplish, look how much better we can be. The fact is, it doesn't happen just by saying it, just by being president. It's it's granular. These mm-hmm. things are, there are so many moving parts within our government, our legislation, our constitution, our, our process, and there's so many moving parts. And the, the fact is that if you recognize that, you know not to make too many big pros- <laughs> promises. And I think that would be my answer on that. Yeah. And um, I mean, I think it's a kind of perpetual myth of new presidents that they're going to remake the landscape. And I think what your book is showing, which is very true, is the way these institutions and and the culture around those institutions become so entrenched that there are marginal differences often. But on something uh, like the national security state, they're not as great as the expectations. Um, Another issue you talk about is bureaucratic porousness. Um, which is an interesting idea. And I was curious if, A, you could explain what exactly that means and the dangers it has created, but also how do you distinguish that um, from uh, the, the kind of flexibility bureaucrats need in many areas of policy to, to make sure things are being implemented and going right? 
Yeah, this is a question I keep asking myself. Like, mm -hmm. is this a is, is there such a thing as good bureaucratic porousness? And here's what I have to say. Um, um, and part of me wants to say it's obvious when it's wrong. When the White House is controlling the Department of Justice and sees it as an arm of, you know, it's not just a violation of the idea and ideals of separation of powers. It is a violation of bureaucratic integrity, right? The biggest way we saw this was not just within the Department of Homeland Security, but between the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security. I noticed that Merrick Garland in his speech yesterday referred to the Department of Justice as the, and he made a point of it, the largest law enforcement agency in the country. For years, DHS has claimed that mantle. And in claiming that mantle, it has been, in essence, an extension of the Department of Justice. This is bureaucratic porousness. It's where if you can't do it within one department, you can do it in the other department. But, you know, um, under Trump, the attorney general was referred to as the real secretary of Homeland Security. So that to me, when it's not clear what, how you, what, where the separation is between agencies and within agencies, as I said before in DHS, it sets a pattern that is potentially very harmful. And you'll notice one of the first things that Garland, Garland did was to set out a memo saying, guess what? We're going to institute some barriers between the White House and the Department of Justice. It is not okay for us to just do what they say, which is what happened under not only the prior president, but particularly under the prior president. And so if that kind of explains it a bit. Yeah, it's a tough question. And I mean, it, it's become a standard conservative argument about government and excessive bureaucratic leeway. You know this, you're at a law school. Um, but I was thinking of that as I read the book and, and how those distinctions are made are, are difficult. Um, and it might be in different policy realms, they work differently. But you could also have a carve out for this is the, the rule. And if you want to, if there's a reason to go around this rule, then present the reason. It can't be done behind the scenes. It can't be done by decree. It can't be done by secret memo. <laughs> you know, it, it, of course, there, there's always going to be that need for share. Look, as we confront things, you know, the real uh, security threats, as we start to confront pandemic, you know, or continue to confront pandemic, climate change, displaced persons, all of these things that are beyond any one agency, um, there are going to have to be made those trade-offs. The more transparent they are, the clearer the intent of them, the better. Uh, and that that's a good good formulation. And um, I just wanted to remind everyone, you can send questions as we're speaking and we'll get to them soon. And we will get to President Trump, former President Trump in a second. We're just moving our way there. Um, but uh, so so in terms of the thinking, really the apparatus, uh, kind of the, the strengthening of the imperial presidency that some thought was going to go away uh, after Nixon, is 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 really taking place it's accelerating under president bush after 9 11. it's entrenched uh with um president obama uh maybe changed in some ways and maybe some reforms but you're arguing it's still very much there and there's a tension between this apparatus and core democratic values and and culture the rule of law is uh kind of a, a a thread uh, through through the book and in terms of what you're thinking about, is the rule of law always a good thing? And I know I'm asking again, a law professor, but um, is, is that a priority? Well, I'm a historian, so you can ask, you know, it's okay, okay. to ask. Either way, <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's true. We kind of take for granted um, in this conversation, national security, civil liberties, et cetera, that the rule of law is, you know, a not to be questioned. Um, but yes, the rule of law is a good thing, and I'll tell you why. Because without it, you have you don't have society. You have chaos, mm -hmm. and the rule of law is a stand-in for organizing principles. And you know that can take a variety of different forms. But what we mean by rule of law is um, the willingness to live together on this earth by sharing a set of values, principles, covenants, and guidelines, and what's right and wrong. And so, yes, it's good, but it shouldn't be abused um, and it shouldn't, but it also shouldn't be denigrated. And what we've seen is a kind of denigration of it. And, you know, again, Biden referred to the rule of law very strongly today in his uh, remarks. I think um, um, what's interesting about, you know, your question, you know, how do we, how should we value the rule of law is it still has to be handled 
um, uh, uh, carefully. The rule of law is not just the Ten Commandments. Okay, here's what we do and here's what we not do. The rule of law is a bunch of nuanced reasonings about things at a time when people seem to have less and less appetite for complexity. The rule of law is actually very complex. It sounds like, you know, something very straightforward. It's not. And that's why your reference to the imperial presidency is really important. Because when you have a situation where Congress defers to national, the president on national security issues. I bring up the authorization for the use of military force, for example. That basically, Congress was out of the game for declaring a war. It's supposed to be a congressional, right? That's what Congress is supposed to do. Now you can decide, they're saying to the president. When you have a situation where the courts are deferring time and time and time again to the president on national security issues, claiming state secrets in a, in a way that, you know, um, you know, diminishes how it was in the past in terms of volume um, and intensity, then you really have to ask yourself, what is the rule of law? Is the rule of law what the president says it is? Is it just a, a sense of executive orders? Mm -hmm. um, what is it? And so that's the problem with the rule of law. It doesn't actually mean, you know, name the values, the principles. It's, it's, it's a promise to, to join together to try to regulate ourselves as human beings to live in a constructive um, hopefully peaceable world. And I, th I mean, the rule of law has, has not, it hasn't come under attack, but I think questions have emerged in part with Black Lives Matter and the way in which uh, key parts of that rule of law are uh, racially loaded. And also just with the politicization of the courts, I think people now might see rule of law differently because they're thinking of justices with an agenda. So rule of law and justice are kind of two different things in my mind. Yeah. Um, and, and, and justice, the American challenge right now is to re-engage re sort of citizen trust in its institutions. And one of the primary, and all of the institutions, whether it's the president, Congress, or um, the courts. And the courts have, have to have something to answer for. Injustice is rampant in this country. Um, it didn't just happen in the last year that injustice is, is rampant. It may have been catching up to itself. Um, and we see time and time again, the privileged, the wealthy, the white, um, not have the same kind of justice that others have. And it, we know it's unfair. And it's it's been proven. It's not a question of whether it's unfair. It's a question of some people think that unfair is OK. <laughs> so is, you know, to your point. And um, it's a it's a huge challenge, and um, there is not not yet a blueprint for getting through it. And I think the follow up to the uh, January sixth uh, insurrection is really important on the part of the Department of Justice, and we're still sort of don't have a sense of where or if that's going anywhere. And um, now that we're moving into the Trump era in our discussion, I mean, one thread is is what you're talking about, and all these changes. And then there's the story, which was also part of January 6th, of, of racial and ethnic political backlash. We see it in immigration. We see it on race. How do those two stories for you fit together? The story of sort of the subtle tools and, and, and the... Yeah, yeah, subtle tools. How is that part of your story? Very, okay. So one of the things that the subtle tools do... Uh, okay. So in terms of immigration, let me just start there. The way in which the, um, I would argue, it was the Islamophobia that was unleashed after 9-11 and in, in, unleashed institutionally, whether it was surveilling Muslim communities, um, fearing that, you know, if you follow the pre precise laws from before in terms of Fourth Amendment protections and, you know, violating them, then we wouldn't be safe at home, just as the, as the argument went. The targeting of Muslim communities was an opening up of a racial, racially acceptable acceptable, discriminatory, ethnically and religiously discriminatory narrative. And I would argue that it provided the wedge and the language and the mindset to sort of open up to this sort of submerged um, um, racism that we've seen. And it is, it is um, so that's how I would tie it into that. In terms of the subtle tools, the way in which the um, bureaucratic imprecision, the way in which politics were able to invest themselves into policies and into the courts in such a pronounced way, um, whether you're talking about George Floyd or you're talking about the Trump um, uh, attempts to quell the Black Lives Matter protests with, 
I mean, you know, I have a whole chapter on the protest, which I want to say that I got so engaged in it that I almost had to like start another book because it's extraordinary the way in which they were willing to take anything they could in the government to attack the Black Lives Matter protest. And what you see is what they're trying to do is figure out what will work. Who can they call in in a, in a racially um, tense context? Who can they call in that will work? Can they call in DHS guards? And under this theory of, the, of, of uh, bureaucratic porousness, we can just take border guards and transport them to Portland um, or to where else in the country we want. What, um, what agencies can we pull into Portland, camouflage them, and have them work because we're saying this is for um, to, to counter these Black Lives Matter protests. And, you know, as a result, um, they didn't get exactly what they wanted. And that's kind of an interesting part of this. What stopped the Portland? Portland is a, one of these moments that shouldn't be missed. Um, and it's a very long moment. You know, it's like many months. Um, they tried so many things from Washington. They tried getting the attorney general involved. They tried getting many of DHS's um, agencies involved. They tried uh, influencing the courts. They tried, and it didn't work. And it didn't work for, for a lot of very interesting reasons. But, um, but that's how this led to this moment, which is the willingness and the desire to create more conflict and more conflagration and to show we're gonna do whatever we need to, to, you know, to answer this um, Black Lives Matter protest. It just, so that's how I think it fits together. Does the, I mean, I know you're focused on the national level, but do the subtle tools, have they been part of local policing and law enforcement as well? Some of what you described might broken windows and get kind of the, the changes in policing we saw after the 80s. Is it similar or is it different story? You know, I, I haven't, my my gut instinct is it's it's the same story just yeah. on a different level whether it's secrecy whether it's bar i think it might be worse on the local level because you know you can do things with your friends and neighbors that you can't do you know in the kind of scrutiny that that um congress and that the executive um has so my guess is we would find it elsewhere it might look and feel a little different but that it would it would still be there and I want to turn now to Trump. And uh, let me start by asking for you, what's at stake in decentering the Trump presidency, which you do? Uh, not that it's not central, not that it's not very important, but you're putting it in this long term perspective. Uh, for you, why was that an important step to take with this book? To decenter it? Mm -hmm. You know, that's really interesting because I think of it as the culmination of this, which is a little different than decentering it. And what's, but it's interesting that you say that because one of the things I was really looking forward to tonight for this conversation was that because it was January 6th, we would focus on the Trump part of the book, which is at least half, if not more, of the book. And yet everyone wants to talk about the war on terror and national security. And so it wasn't that I was decentering him in my mind. It was that I was taking what happened in a context attached largely to a foreign enemy, to take largely in the sort of um, international conversation, largely focused as much as those presidents could do uh, outward and bringing it home and taking these subtle tools and say they work. You know, when it was talking about a foreign threat, now we're going to use these tools at home for a whole range of things. It doesn't have to be tied to national security. Many of the things I deal with are, whether it's the Soleimani strike or, or immigration, but the dealing with immigration, Trump owns how these, how egregious and cruel and unlawful much of it was, but he's on a continuum. It, it, this is not this. This we should have seen this coming. Some people did see it coming. We didn't. We Congress did not need to provide these tools willingly and knowingly. Whether it was the Patriot Act, the authorizations for for force, or the Department of Homeland Security. And now you see, you know, um, you see some ramifications of this. The conversation goes on in uh, over the Capitol insurrection in some very interesting ways. You notice that now they're they're talking in the Inspector General report on the Capitol Police. Oh, you know, it was a problem of miscommunication. It was a problem of intelligence gathering. It was these are now tried and true things that we know are on the surface to hide other things that were going on in terms of directed, nefarious, unlawful activity. So I don't see Trump as um yeah, I am. I'm. I'm decentering him in terms of the use of these tools, but not in terms of the potency with which he used them. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense, and that's a, a great description. Uh, but I mean, the power 
from the book comes from your ability to do that uh, and to do it effectively. And when you write about Trump, uh, there's a quote, sensing the power of the tools, imprecision and the degradation of language, the disdain for transparency and a green light for bureaucratic imprecision and disarray and their collective ability to strengthen the fourth tool, the disruption of norms, the 45th president gathered them up and wheeled them without restraint. In doing so, he transformed the presidency, the larger executive branch, and the culture of governance in America. Sensing can be read in different ways. And I'm uh, interested in your um, views on how intentional was President Trump? How cognizant was he of what he was doing? Or as some see him, was he kind of an accidental president? No. He was completely cognizant. Like if I could write the, you know, the fictional account, um, it, the non-fictional part is he was very cognizant of it. And let me just give you some like very obvious low, low level things. He, he refused to put people in positions of power and to, uh, and to follow the rules for Senate confirmation. Mm -hmm. There were at times, some of the top officials throughout the executive were not confirmed, right? The, 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 the appetite for knowing what not having not confirmed officials would mean, right? Acting officials would be under his thumb until they were confirmed even, or just appointing another one. And so you have a succession of, um, of individuals who are not confirmed um, in their positions. That is not unintentional, all right? So just to give you an example of that, the, um, the, the, the reading of the law, to talk about the rule of law, to find the loopholes for in very, things that we might not think about. We're not talking about, you know, the president's power to do X, Y, and Z. We're talking about using, for example, the post office to interfere with the elections and understanding that in a granular way. So it wasn't like we're going to create a new department at the depart of, of post office. We're going to sort of shift things. This, these are intentional. Whoever was advising in the White House, they looked at look at schedule schedule f something i talk about at the end of the um trump presidency where they changed the categorization of civil servants versus political appointees and basically political appointees can now become civil servants so that the idea was when trump left office there would be political individuals inside in these career positions throughout the government right um we saw a similar kind of thing for different reasons at, at the pentagon this is not unintentional this is these are, and one of the things that you know you have to think about after this is what is the remedy for a president who comes in and intentionally corrupts the appointments process, the bureaucratic process in terms of nominees, um, individuals holding top positions, the lower level people as well. Should they all have to go home? Like what what is the remedy? And we we're not dealing with that, and we need to. So just. I yeah. I, I once interviewed uh, uh, David Frum at the beginning of the, I can't remember what part of the presidency, but one of the things he said, I remember it stuck with me, was that Donald Trump as a person uh, has an uncanny ability to exploit weaknesses, to sense vulnerabilities and weaknesses, wow. and then to exploit them. And wow. I think that's probably true of institutions. And, and I think, I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That rings true to, you know, everything you look at. Where's the fissure? Where and, and, and there's so many of them, right? How could there not be? But he didn't just look for things that were were unknown in the past, which is what like Schedule F was. But the use of the uh, Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice is still something we don't know exactly what happened during Trump. But boy, I'd like to see some of those memos that, again, this was something that you didn't have to be have any particular um, you know, sensibility for it to realize that that was a powerful office that could be used to powerful ends, whether it was justifying the killing of uh, 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 Qasem Soleimani um, or whether it had to do with how to use the um, Insurrection Act or how to avoid Posse Comitatus. So um, he had both is what I'm saying, both an instinct for weakness and a willingness to exploit what had already been exploited. And why do you think, uh, and this is either with the Trump presidency or before, why does Congress go along with this? It's the kind of age old question, but why do they delegate? Why do they allow the presidency to become so strong? Why are they so timid uh, or are they timid? I'll pose it as a question um, in, in allowing these assertions to happen. So there's the cynical answer and the non-cynical answer. I'll start with the non-cynical, which, which is, um, 
they're scared. 9-11 was, to start at the beginning of this narrative, terrifying. Just like January 6th was. Three, they really felt they couldn't. Like they, there was a sense of helplessness that that fear engendered. And there was no, to this day, there is no adult in the room who is willing to look at the American people and say, um, since 9-11, we have built up the most incredible military, industrial, technological um, defense and offensive uh, mechanisms in the world. And we are safe. We, we don't even have that official today. So that's the, believe it or not, non-cynical answer. The cynical answer is um, money and money in politics and who's supporting who and whose side they're on. And I don't have to go into all of that, but you know, it's a combination of, of fear, um, not wanting to, in the best of senses, not wanting to let your constituents down and knowing you don't have the ability to know what to do or how to do it. And we need politicians who are not afraid to think they know um, how to how to make decisions and judgments in the world. And do you think, uh, just to throw on more, partisanship uh, played a big role in why Congress ultimately, as in the impeachment, uh, kind of wasn't willing to go very far, or is it overstated? I don't think it's overstated. Mm -hmm. I think that the partisanship, you know how they say it now, do you, your T-shirt is all that matters, you know, this shirt, the identification shirt. Um, yeah. I think the partisanship is is really become part of being a politician, which is really quite um, sad. And how we get back from that, um, I don't really, I guess I should say how we go forward from that, um, I don't really know, but that's for you. You have uh, to figure uh, that out. <laughs> okay, I'll get to that. Yeah, um, that's a big responsibility. Do, do uh, And I see uh, questions there, and I'll get to it in a second. Do do. Do people care? Uh, I mean, we all discuss the erosion of democracy and we talk about different elements of it. Do you think that the public is concerned about it or is it like this movie, Don't Look Up, um, where no one's really paying attention uh, other than for a few seconds? I think when it comes to quote unquote national security, people don't care in a very kind of fundamental way except for with talking points it's just it, there are too many issues to get your head around and there's too many different opinions and there's too many experts and so i, I think there is a kind of like just stop you know and so there, it's not you know penetrating i think in terms of what it means to have a democracy and live on this earth in your locality in your country um, i think people care very much i think they care about where their kids go to school i think they care about the fact that they they can't afford to send their kids to college. The middle class can't afford to send its kids to college. I think they care about the fact that their children are um, at risk when they walk into a, a classroom. I think, I guess what I'm saying is people care about their children. <laughs> um, but I think that, yes, I think they do care on a very fundamental level and are so scared and have been so scared for so long, for this entire century, essentially, that um, they don't, it's like cognitive dissonance. They just don't know what to do the information, but I believe they care deeply. I'm gonna just take a break from my questions to read this question from Michael. Um, what would you tell people, especially young people, that they can do to help protect democracy and open society in America? Um, so that's something I think about all the time. <laughs> um, first of all, I think they should consider running for office at any level. I think getting back into the, 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 the story of civic engagement, whether it's in your local city council or volunteering for whatever it is, um, is extremely important and open to you. Don't, you know, the idea that you can't do that is wrong. I think, um, I think what we need to tell our children and that will really empower, and our grandchildren in my case, that will really empower them is uh, we got it wrong. We didn't figure it out. Uh, we tried, some of us, um, and we just didn't figure it out and you can do better. So whatever it is you think you might be able to think about, you think about it because it's not off the table. And if you wanna build a better world, you have as good a chance as anybody else. I think we need to empower them. I think we need to empower youth. And this idea that they're too young, no, this is their world. They have a better sense of it. Um, if, if the technological revolution isn't the best metaphor, you know, um, 
And I think we need to trust them in a major, major, major way in as many ways as we can. And we need to let them feel that trust. And how would you, so one of the tensions always is, uh, you know, in World War II, in the Cold War today, the tensions between what you need to do, uh, quote unquote, to protect the country and to achieve security versus um, uh, the rule of law and, and democratic rights. It's kind of an age old tension, but you've studied this, you've now written so much about it. Is it possible to have a strong national security apparatus with the very real threats we always face that doesn't uh, start or continue the process of dismantling the democracy? Can democracy and national security in the modern age coexist? Only if national security, um, if the national security state or establishment or set of institutions um, gives up on some of these subtle tools. And the most important one is secrecy. Not everything has to be secret. Americans are not that stupid. They can be brought into the conversation. I will say one thing about the, the DNI of real Haynes, which is that report after report after report is coming out of this office about a number of things. That's what we need. They don't have to tell us everything, but the idea that I noticed that one of the um, remedies that the inspector general has um, in terms of January 6th and the Capitol Police is they should be more of an intelligence service. They should have an intelligence office. No, this is what happened after 9-11. Everybody wanted to be part of a conversation that was classified. No, classification, national security should be narrowed to every possible extent that it should be narrowed. And so, I mean, that's a beginning to answer your question. Do you think, was there a difference? I'm thinking about this. I mean, President Bush, uh, George W., a lot of the criticism was clearly around then, and, and you really lay out how this starts. Some would argue that he was more concerned about a, a real threat, meaning just the aftermath of 9-11. How was, was President Trump concerned about any threats, or was this a president kind of in a very different place in terms of using all these tools. Yeah, I don't think it I don't think it was the threat matrix that was on his mind. I mm -hmm. think it was the I'm going to beat you matrix that was on his mind. The fact that General Soleimani was, you know, uh, trying to conduct and conducting terrorist attacks in the Middle East when and, and against our interests was not something he wanted to uh, put up with. And so there was a threat, but the degree to which he was willing to go, it seemed to me more about a contest of wills rather than an idea of threat. And I'd have to really, you know, think about that and play that out ways. But it was like his, he, he as the spokesman for the country, it was ego rather than, um, rather than what is the nature of the threat, which doesn't mean that people inside the intelligence community and elsewhere in the national security weren't giving, in, in many instances, some real threat assessments of what was a threat and what wasn't a threat. But in terms of how you see where he actually acts, and I'm picking Soleimani because I write about this in the book, it's it's more a sense of, um, of, um, of showmanship and of, of symbolism. And so I think that, that that's a little different than what Bush was dealing with. So it's more, in some ways, unhinged from any yeah. Yeah. any basis at that point. More and more like we see other dictators behaving, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. Uh, question from Peter. Uh, what is the role of our media broadly defined in a course correction of our country? And what is your view of good media to pay attention to and bad media to ignore? Oh, my goodness. Where do I begin? Um, you know, I think it's okay to have good media and bad media. I think what you need to do is to have a population that knows how to discern and between the two. And we haven't done a good enough job at that. And that's something we as educators um, need to think about. It's, you know, I mean, there's certain things that would come across my screen. I'm like, you're kidding me. Um, but we need, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't exist. It means that we need to we need to have a better sense of what's going on. We need to have a better sense of media literacy and who's spinning what. Look, when you went to graduate school, didn't every book you read, didn't you think, who the hell wrote this? Like, mm -hmm. wait, wait a minute, before I read this book on, you know, whatever it is, I'm gonna find out about this guy. What happened to that? That that's that needs to be, look, it's a lot harder when you're being bombarded. So you have to do it a hundred times a day instead of twice a semester, but it's an important tool. Who's saying what they're saying and why are they saying it? And we should be asking it for everything and always should have been. And um, I, I like to end on a, a positive note, but maybe I won't. I'm going to see what you say um, as, as we get closer to the end. But 
the tools, the subtle tools are very powerful tools that you lay out and you lay out how they have been effective over decades now. And they're very entrenched. And even a president like Obama, who in some places had genuinely good intentions, couldn't achieve what he wanted. Is it possible uh, to restore uh, the vitality and strength of democracy if these subtle tools are so effective? How, how do you do that? Um, we ha you have to um, accept uh, accountability as an option. We have been a country that, at least for the last two decades, has decided that public officials are not really accountable when it comes to major egregious violations of their oaths of office and violations of law and the Constitution. And so, and we just won't, you're not going to be, it started with, you know, torture, <laughs> let's say. Um, it's not okay to say that torture is illegal and to implement a torture uh, regime. That shouldn't be a very far, you know, uh, reaching statement. <laughs> like, seriously? Um, if those people aren't accountable and, and the other increments of um, misdeeds are also not accountable. And now, look, we saw it with the Bob Mueller investigation, right? That was a wake up call to Americans. Like, um, I'm sorry, a memo from the Department of Justice says that you can't indict a sitting president. And the reason is because he won't uh, be able to perform the duties of the president. Let's discuss um, that, that there is a unwillingness to have accountability for anything. And the reason may be that if he's held accountable, maybe somebody will say, I'm held accountable. It doesn't matter. Once people are accountable for egregious abuses of law, policy, norms, and they have to be written into the laws. So we need new legislation in a lot of areas in terms of if you don't appoint, just to give you a little, if you don't appoint somebody for, you know, as head of Homeland Security in the given time, and if you refuse to have Senate confirmation for your top officials, here's what happens. Here's who appoints them. Here's what the, there has to be something. We have nothing. It's a blank slate for many of these things. And maybe just to take on, build on that for the final question, um, what would you like to see? We started with January 6th. Uh, we're in the middle uh, of this anniversary, but also a debate about what should happen. We have a congressional hearing. We have Garland's statement, but unclear what he's going to do. What would you like to see happen that would connect to some of what you're saying in terms of accountability? I think the Department of Justice needs to, to um, whatever they say they're doing, and I hear all these good things, I think that they have to realize that their time is running out and that they need to, as aggressively as possible, um, gather the facts about the people who led this insurrection. By the way, we, as Biden said today, we saw it, okay? Evidence comes in a variety of forms. They need to do things, whether they're just symbolic and that moves the football, you know, or moves the narrative, that's fine. But they need to get on top of this and they need to do it ex quickly. And um, they need to do it with the full sense of, of what's uh, there. I, I wanna say one thing more on this. One of the things that Biden talked a lot about and has since the beginning of his, from day one, is process, 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 process. His executive orders were so detailed in terms of process, they were very different than other executive orders, right? That's because the abrogation of process by his predecessor was so profound. I think that was an intentional decision. Now you have a situation where Garland is saying process, 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 but not without a real sense of urgency and tomorrow. And that needs to be done. And that can be done. More, more, you know, more intensity, more people, more hours, whatever it takes. I'll just say, Karen, thanks for a great uh, conversation before she closes up. And it's a fantastic book. I urge, I really urge everyone to read it. Thoughtful, smart, and uh, very insightful. Thank you, Julian. Thank you so much. Well, thanks to both of our fantastic speakers for this interesting and timely conversation. I'm going to um, minimize them both from our virtual screen um, and then add just a few parting notes, but thank you so much thanks. to both of you. Just one second. Um, so um, I'm about to put in the chat um, a brief survey that we hope you'll consider filling out if you have the chance, because we'd love to have your feedback on this program. Um, I'm also going to put a QR code here on the screen if you'd like to use your phone to um, hover over it and scan it um, and fill out the survey. We'll also send it out. 
Um, thanks to all of you for joining us this evening for this program. We were so happy to have you. Um, and we hope that you will be present at other library programs. You can visit our website, princetonlibrary.org, in order to see our calendar. Um, so thank you for your time. Have a wonderful evening. And we hope to see you in the future.